Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are, uh, this is the fifth uh, ledger webinar that we're doing this time. We have again for the second time, Marco Churchina, who is going to talk Hi. about uh, open source licensing. Uh, then we will have uh, Cedric Thomas from OW2. OW2 is a European organization that focuses on um, market, marketing of uh, open source software. And then I will say a few words as well. I am Andrea from Dynork. And I think that we can get started. So I will give, leave the floor to Marco. I thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, to say a few words, very, very little things uh, about uh, free software, open source free software. Uh, they're almost, uh, they almost identify the same uh, set of licenses and then software, but I will say a few words about this later. And law, I'm a lawyer, and so uh, my perspective is uh, from low angle, let's say, the, the, the perspective of a lawyer. So uh, we talk about software. Software and law uh, got uh, uh, interacting more deeply, uh, I would say, in the 80s. Uh, before, before that, in the even in the 70s, also in the 60s, there was some debate about uh, how to protect uh, software, but uh, the um, things uh, became more concrete uh, in the 80s, particularly uh, in, in here 1980, uh, in, in the United States was adopted uh, an act, uh, the Software Copyright Act, which uh, clearly identified software as an object uh, Cover protected by copyright. Before that, uh, there was a debate. There was also another other modifications made in the United States uh, before uh, eighty that uh, could allow to say that uh, copyright uh, applies to software. But after the here nineteen eighty, it, it is clear to everybody that software is protected by. Uh, by copyright. There are different, there is an interesting story about how this happened and why happened, but uh, I don't think it's useful here to get into details. And the interesting thing is that when this happened and when other facts happened in the early 80, 80s, uh, some people didn't like that. Some people didn't like the fact that uh, software was becoming protected by copyright, an exclusive right. People could exclude others from uh, use of the software, from the right to use the software. That's when uh, free so the, the idea of free software uh, arised and got uh, formed by the community of, uh, free, of uh, free software. Open source came later as a concept, as an idea. Then applying, soft, uh, applying copyright to software implies uh, uh, certain things because copyright uh, gives to the author uh, the right, the exclusive right to uh, authorize reproduction of the software. Of every creative work. So the author has the exclusive right to authorize reproduction, making copies, or as it happens for software, uh, as way of example, uh, the right to uh, execute it. Because making executing software uh, means uh, uh, making copies. So uh, this also has to be considered. Then a second very important right that copyright attributes to the author is the right to modify the, the work, the creative work. Uh, you cannot modify a work unless you're authorized by the uh, 
the by the author or the other uh, person entity that has copyright on the on the on the software because the author can transfer its his rights on the software to a third entity to a third party a third person third right very important for software the right to distribute the right to uh, put in commerce the the software is used to happen in uh, boxes in the 80s in the 90s today you can distribute uh, software also through internet for example uh, allowing people to download uh, software but at that time uh, distribution was mainly uh, achieved through distribution of physical objects uh, with software uh, embedded in it. So copyright, uh, uh, copyright was born as the right that applies to creative works, uh, painting, books, uh, movies. Uh, this is the uh, old uh, domain of uh, copyright. Then applying uh, copyright, that's the right of creative works to software was a process. It was a process that was achieved through enacting new laws and, uh, and, uh, and providing expressly for uh, copyright protection for software. Uh, the same thing happened also in Europe in the, in the 90s. So since uh, the 90s, we have also in Europe laws that apply copyright to software. Of course, copyright provides for, all, for other rights. Uh, some of these rights are uh, uh, very important when you talk about software today, like, uh, for example, the, the right to communicate to the public, which today in the cloud uh, uh, things is, is uh, very relevant. But if you think about uh, copyright and software in the 80s, those three rights were particularly re relevant, reproduction, modification, and distribution. Then what happens when uh, copyright uh, comes and applies to software? That a new rule uh, is enacted, the rule that, that provides for an uh, exclusive right for the author to prohibit reproduction, modification, and distribution. Uh, in the same years, for reasons that is, uh, it was uh, totally unpredictable. While uh, the, the legislator in, in the US made the choice for copyright, at the same time, judges uh, decided that also patents, uh, patents on invention, apply to software. This is a very important case, uh, Diamond versus Deher, uh, that in the 1981, this, for the first time ruled that uh, software can be protected by patents. So to this situation, somebody uh, reacted uh, opposing. They didn't want didn't like the fact that co uh, copyright uh, was protecting uh, software, prohibiting, uh, prohibiting uh, free use of software. Then that's where uh, the concept of free software, uh, this was Richard Stallman uh, in the right. On the left, you have uh, this, uh, the logo of the GNU project. GNU, uh, you know, is GNU is not Unix, uh, a recursive acronym for the project that started the creation of free, the free software uh, concept idea. So, uh, okay, I forgot to translate the uh, definition of free software. Uh, this is the definition of free software that was uh, elaborated, created by Richard Stallman. Uh, with the four freedoms, freedom to run, freedom to study, freedom to distribute, and freedom to modify, it, modify and distribute copy modified. 
Then uh, the other thing that uh, was uh, fostered by the work of uh, Richard Stallman and Free Software Foundation was the creation of the idea of free licenses. Licenses that apply to software that comply with the definition of free software. Then free licenses are licenses like the GPL, it's the more well-known uh, free software license. Uh, a license that fosters creation and distribution and uh, continuing uh, uh, availability of software as free software. Okay, this is just to let you know that where all these things comes fr come from, uh, it's uh, an ethical uh, choice that pushed Stallman and other people to work around the idea of free software. Nowadays, there is much more, there's a lot of business around the free software, uh, but uh, that's where all things come, come from. Okay, in the 90s, some, a group of people uh, thought that uh, uh, using the free software definition and approach very much focused on uh, ethical aspects was somehow uh, a problem in the sense that was uh, taking apart industry. The industry, uh, so they made a new definition, open source, the open source definition. They made a new, uh, a new entity, the open source initiative and a new definition, open source definition, and which is different from the free software uh, definition, but not so much in the sense that uh, uh, if you list the free software licenses, uh, the, the licenses that comply with the free software definition, and if you, if you list licenses that comply with the open source definition, you see that they're basically pointing to the almost the same, the same uh, set of uh, licenses. Today, there are many uh, free licenses, licenses that comply with the definition of free software slash open source. And uh, if you want, you can create another to, tomorrow because it's, you know, it's just a, a question of complying with the definition. But luckily, uh, what happened? Okay, luckily, uh, the most used free software licenses, open source licenses are small number of, of licenses. There's a small number of licenses. And this makes much uh, uh, easy in the large number of cases uh, to deal with the uh, different licenses. And uh, uh, there is a natural tendency to reuse a licenses that is well known and uh, widely adopted by the communities uh, as a free, open so free software open source license. If you want to dig into how uh, different free software licenses work, I suggest you to go to the GNU project uh, website that lists different free software licenses and licenses compatible with GDPL and not, et cetera. Or to the open source initiative uh, website where also you have a list of licenses. Very useful is Wikipedia that provides for uh, comparison lists also. The managing with, uh, with free software, with free software licenses implies managing with mainly two rights, copyright and patent rights. These are the rights that are managed usually by uh, free software licenses. Managing with free software more widely implies also taking into account other rights like trademarks, uh, rights on secret information and sometimes other rights. So this is uh, uh, Carcassonne is a picture I made and it's uh, the most uh, easy for me uh, picture to understand the concept of copyleft. Copyleft uh, is, a, uh, you know, is a joke in the sense that copy left is contrary to copy right. Left means uh, also not only uh, the left hand, but also uh, permission. So copy left is 
a permission to copy, let's say. Uh, copyleft is the main characteristic of uh, free software licenses, and that's why uh, usually we, cut, we classify licenses according to uh, the presence or not of the copyleft clause within the, within the free software license and how it works, the copyleft uh, clause. What is the meaning of the copyleft clause? The copyleft clause says, you can do what you want with the, with the software, but if you redistribute it, or sometimes if you allow people to use it by uh, uh, remotely through internet, you have to provide to your users the same rights that were provided to you. So you have to use the same license for your users. So this is the copyleft effect. You can do what you want, but if you distribute or sometimes depending on the licenses, you allow users to reuse the software remotely, you have to uh, license the software and make it available according to the same license uh, that was applied to you. So there are no copyleft licenses like the BSD license, the Apache license. There are strong, the strongest copyleft license is the GPL license. There are weak copyleft licenses, weak in the sense that they prohibit, but they allow something. And so the issue is to understand what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, we will get into this maybe later looking at different licenses. Network copyleft, like the AGPL license, is uh, a copyleft effect, uh, copyleft clause that uh, uh, applies also to the case uh, where you uh, want to allow users to remotely access your software through the internet. If you have software in cloud, let to use the word that is uh, very much used in this year, but it's very um, not precise, not uh, clear. But if you, you, if you provide a service uh, using a software that is uh, under AGPL, that is a network copyleft license, you have to provide access to the uh, source code of, uh, your, of, your, so, of your software. Now, the, the issue of compatibility. When you want to uh, mix different uh, pieces of software uh, uh, um, that are available according to different licenses, you have to uh, deal with the issue of the compatibility different licenses are not compatible among them. So sometimes you have to pay, at, well, when, if you want to mix uh, software with different licenses, you have to pay attention to this issue. This is a side effect uh, of, uh, of um, copyleft clauses. Sometimes copyleft clauses have the effect to uh, uh, prohibit make, putting together pieces of software with different licenses. Uh, so this is just an issue to deal with. And the most uh, uh, useful advice to give is to think about this at the very beginning of your uh, project. Because when you consider this issue of compatibility at the very beginning, you can easily find a path to uh, avoid this problem. If you uh, face with this problem at the end, sometimes you have a problem. Uh, so using mapping uh, the different pieces of software that you reuse uh, and, uh, um, and uh, since the beginning, uh, taking note of the copyright, that the licenses that apply to them, it's, it's a very important thing to do since the very beginning of the project. Okay, uh, if you look at the patent, uh, at the patent side, which is usually less uh, important, but in some technological domain, it's important to take into account also the patent issue. Uh, uh, there are licenses that provide for express licenses. There are licenses that provide for implicit licenses, uh, patent license. There are licenses provide for a, a retaliation clause. If you attack me uh, for uh, your patents, uh, claiming 
patent right on the software, you lose the uh, your the, la the license I uh, I use to distribute the software is terminated against you. So a, a, a retaliation clause. Then there are code assistance agreement. I see my time is over. Then uh, uh, I will go very fast just to tell you that. Uh, there are different licenses, GPL, uh, it's uh, certainly one of the, GPL3, it's one of the most interesting licenses because it's very, uh, very articulated and very careful in taking, taking into account the issue of freedom for the users. BSD, but also MIT are non-copyleft licenses. LGPL is a weak copyleft license. This means that linking from libraries with different licenses is allowed. My time is over. Okay. And uh, AGPL is a, is a network copyleft license. This implies that the source code should be uh, available to users that use the software remotely. Mozilla Public License and Apache License are um, other very important licenses to remember. I mentioned you because we are somehow connected to European projects, uh, uh, the EUPL. It's uh, a somehow interesting license for different reasons, but mainly adopted by projects that are connected with uh, EU and Public European public administrations, not very much uh, adopted in uh, communities uh, working with uh, free software. Free software is not just uh, an issue of licenses, and uh, sorry for going too deep at the beginning, and that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, quick and uh, effective. I hope that everybody had a good uh, overview of different uh, free license software. If you have questions, we can look at them afterwards because uh, there are probably also in this chat several people who can answer that. Okay, I'm going to give now the floor to Cedric. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, a couple of words about uh, what you will talk about, Cedric, because uh, I, I will. Uh, I don't know you. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Good. Yes. Right. So um, thank you for um, inviting me. And um, uh, so what I'm going to tell you, talk about is uh, more the, um, how can I put it? Well, there are several ways to talk about open source. Uh, we can talk about it from a legal perspective as Marco just did. And you can talk about it as a technical perspective, uh, um, perspective from a technical perspective. You can also talk about it from an industry perspective. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that from OW2. And I would like to sell you uh, after this, uh, uh, during this talk, the idea to use a service that we are providing that is called Reach Out. So a word about uh, uh, what we do at OW2. We are a non-profit organization out of Europe. Uh, I guess you will have the slide, so I'm not going to go too much into details here. You will uh, uh, realize that we are a real community-driven organization, so we're independent from any commercial vendor or any government. And uh, we have a focus on open source as a uh, part of the industry, uh, the part of the software industry. So we have this market-driven perspective. So our mission is to promote a code base that uh, concentrates on software for uh, inform corporate information systems. So we don't do gaming, we don't do embedded software, we do software for uh, information systems, complex information systems. Uh, the software is developed by a community of uh, 30 corporate uh, members and uh, 2,500 uh, individual members. Uh, we, uh, this community works in the framework of activities, the project and initiatives such as uh, uh, market readiness or good governance initiatives. You can check that on our website. Our governance is totally transparent. Everything is on the website, even our accounts. 
and we're independent because our members uh, pay their fees. So you can compare us to uh, Linux Foundation, Eclipse Foundation, Apache Foundation, OpenStack Foundation, but uh, okay, we're a niche player, but uh, we are the, uh, the genuine European player. So a word about open source from a uh, market perspective. So open source is here, is here to stay in case uh, you, uh, you need it to be convinced. A study by Sonatype shows that uh, uh, over 80% of uh, all new applications is uh, made of uh, existing code, most of it uh, from uh, open source software. And a recent study or report by uh, Red Hat shows that uh, most uh, CIOs identify open source with uh, innovative companies. Uh, so that's a driver for adoption of open source. And the same report by Red Hat identifies that uh, open uh, proprietary software within the information systems is uh, is going down, and that uh, the the share they give is uh, the, um, uh, you have it there, it down to thirty two percent in the next couple of years. So there is a an unstoppable growth of open source software within enterprise of enterprise uh, uh, information systems. Now, from an industry or more even an economic perspective, open source creates value. Uh, it's probably uh, understated because of uh, free software, free as in free media software. So we do have a, um, uh, uh, an evaluation of uh, how much uh, the open source market is worth, but it's probably much, uh, worth much more than that. So the evaluation is that it creates uh, 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 5.2 billion euros uh, of uh, value in France, 25 billion in Europe. So that's, uh, and with a growth that is double the current uh, uh, growth of the uh, average IT market. And in terms of uh, jobs, uh, there is another thing that is very important is that open source creates real jobs. Uh, these are good jobs uh, with high value, high uh, purchasing power jobs, jobs that cannot be uh, offshored easily because they provide proximity services. They, uh, they live and they, they grow on uh, uh, services and being close to the, to the users and the customers and the market. So these jobs, so we evaluate that there are 52,000 of those jobs, uh, uh, open source jobs in France and uh, 230,000 jobs in, uh, in Europe. So these are studies made by the uh, French association. That's why I have a focus on French uh, figures. So that's a real, uh, a real uh, market power or industry power. And there is no wonder why we have uh, so many of those uh, 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 press headlines saying that open source has won, open source is here, et cetera. So that's, that's on the positive side, but on the negative side or on the darker side, uh, there is much talk about open source sustainability and threats on open source. Maybe the SaaS models is threatening open source software or the cloud model is threatening open source software. And we have much talks of uh, maintainers, uh, uh, burnout of um, people inventing new licenses to make sure they can derive some profit out of, uh, uh, out of uh, doing business with open source software. Uh, or creating new models like uh, we call that the gig economy out of donations or, uh, or uh, uh, one-off uh, teams that uh, are short-lived. But that's very uh, pretty much uns uh, unsustainable. And maybe the best example are today some of the financing platforms that are trying to develop, but these are very, very modest. And there are models and all that uh, happens, but you, you have to understand that there is not just one open source. There are many different types of open source and not all open source or free software are equal. And I'd like to focus now on what I usually identify as open source value chain models. There are four of those value chains. The first one is the one that Marco uh, uh, introduced that uh, was appeared uh, over 30 years ago, well, close to 40 years ago, because that's, uh, that was in September 83 that Richard Stallman sent his uh, um, famous mail saying, uh, it's Thanksgiving, guys, and I'm going to create a new operating system. It's called GNU, and it's going to be free, and invited people to uh, join him to contribute. and. Um, 
and uh, as a continuation, what he did, he established, uh, because everything goes with uh, legal and lawyers in North America, so that's uh, uh, typically he established the four rights or four freedoms that define what we call free software, the right to use, to read, to uh, distribute and to modify the, the, the software. Things that, as Marco explained, was not possible um, because of some change in the in legislation. So uh, that went on uh, to create the free software mo uh, movement. This is the bedrock of uh, where we stand today. Uh, uh, nothing that we've been talking today uh, would be possible without those four uh, little freedoms, four little groups that uh, have had the power to uh, change the, uh, the rationale of the uh, software industry. But that creates one value chain. It's what I call uh, the uh, open or free software by developers for developers. And that is uh, really, um, uh, that's very efficient. That's still, it's still on. That created many uh, different uh, projects that we know now. We even say that uh, the internet would not exist without this, uh, uh, the, this uh, open source or this free software by developers and for developers. And, and it still exists and it's proven to be efficiently very, um, uh, technically very efficient. Now, that is in the mid 90s, through some dubious ways, what was known as free software became open source software, commercial open source software. And the thing is, at the time, you have to think of the uh, software package market. And there were some of the many vendors, what we call now the proprietary vendors, that were making a lot of money and uh, uh, charging a lot of money and maybe too much. Um, for, for, from users. So they opened up an opportunity for a new wave of uh, uh, software vendors, a new wave of entrants that leverage the um, open source or the free uh, software model to um, uh, inundate the market, to grab market shares and to gradually change into uh, a monet in monetizing this free software by offering uh, additional products products, packaging, software subscriptions, and, um, and services. So that's the, 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 the commercial open source, the, the one we know that really uh, makes today's money, and that constitutes uh, uh, the open source software industry. But it's not just that. That's only two mod the second model. The third model ha happened, uh, appeared around 2010 with cloud computing. And with cloud computing, all vendors, all IT vendors realized that all the technologies were could not be exploited and developed in a silo, that they could not work on their own, that they had to innovate, leveraging what other people had done. So they had to co-innovate. And at that time, uh, names, big names from the IT, IT industry that you would never associate with open source or free software, they've all got uh, uh, on board with open, open source, um, paying, um, and paying hundreds and hundreds of software developers to contribute to some software pro uh, project. Uh, so why they did that? They did that to be to make sure that they could all innovate in group, uh, and that nobody would spend uh, millions of dollars in a, a technology that. Uh, would be abandoned that nobody would uh, follow afterwards. So they, uh, that's, I would call that ecosystem innovation, and they leverage open source as a vehicle for that collaborative innovation. Open source was an enabler of collaborative innovation. And that innovation with all these um, um, participants, they created committees, they created uh, foundations, uh, think of OpenStack, think of uh, Kubernetes, etc., of uh, Open Daylight, and they all decided to share some of their own technologies, of their own technology development, so that they could make sure that they would be uh, building their commercial activity on a um, um, platform, a technical platform that would be viable in the long term. So that's the third model. And then, about two years ago, uh, we realized that uh, another dimension happened in open source with valuation, with some of the open source companies being value, uh, valued, valued at uh, over a billion dollars with a valuation uh, over a billion dollars for some of these uh, uh, small companies, startups. 
so we, we, we get into a new scale, a new scale that was, uh, um, in fact, confirmed by uh, the acquisition of uh, GitHub by Microsoft for $7.5 or $7.5 billion and Red Hat by IBM for $35 billion. So this is another dimension. We're not in the technology. We are a long way away from these, the developers. We're not into the uh, commercial startup uh, trying to compete with the, um, uh, the proprietary vendors. We're not in those big uh, vendors uh, innovating together. We're here in an open source that is part of the, um, uh, one of the pillars, becoming one of the pillars of the uh, IT industry, the software industry. And uh, we get into a financial, uh, financial rational now. And now, and we've seen now a very conventional board members uh, made of people, I mean, very old school uh, board members with people representing pension funds, insurance companies uh, that you cannot suspect of being uh, uh, free software activists. And they've authorized executive teams to actually spend billion dollars and to invest billion dollars in open source companies. So these are the four different models four different models. So some, some, some of our, you may fit in one of those. So if you're a part of a big company uh, contributing to a big consortium, you're, you're in one of those models. If you are uh, creating your own project on GitHub or uh, on W2 GitLab, while well, you're in one of the models. And if you've launched, you're launching a startup that is trying to leverage the uh, open source approach or attractiveness to uh, um, enter the market, you're in, uh, in another model. Uh, so that's more, let's say, from the supply side of code. Let's look, at, so we have these four models here. Now, if we look at the, 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 the demand side uh, of open source, the user side, well, now you have to meet the mainstream market decision maker. It's not a marginal market anymore. It's mainstream, open source is everywhere. The, this, the decision maker you're talking to now is not an open source activist. He's been educated by proprietary software vendors. He makes, he's a corporate executive who has to report to hierarchy and make decisions that are compatible uh, with the, the uh, priorities, uh, the business priorities of uh, his or her uh, organization. And they, um, they, above all, they make long-term business decisions. They, they make, of, of course, there is a, uh, a technical foundation in the decision they make, but uh, it's all wrapped up in a business approach. That's what they do. So you need to, to talk to them with their own language. The thing is, in research, what happens is that um, most of uh, the, the code developers or researchers, uh, they develop code, but the users of the market expect much more than code. They want value. They make business decisions, they want value. And the developers are, say, on the, on the left side of this, uh, uh, um, of this picture there, uh, developing code, proof of concept, demonstrators, et cetera. But what the user wants is something that is more like a product. The value is created by what we call product attributes. You see then there are here like tutorials, testing, upgrades, bus fixing, roadmaps, uh, even contracts, even tariffs, pricing, uh, training, they want uh, complementers. So this is what they expect from, uh, from, from uh, uh, an offering, uh, an open source offering. And that's what we call the delivery challenge. But this value is not just created only by the, uh, the developers themselves. The whole value that is expected by the user side is created by what uh, uh, we can call the ecosystem. But what is the ecosystem in open source software? The ecosystem is comprised of the developers themselves, the systems integrators, the software package vendors, the users themselves. The users are part of the ecosystem because we hope they contribute back and they uh, engage with the developers and they contribute to the long-term um, uh, functioning of the, this ecosystem. So that's, uh, that's what they do. But there is also the open source organizations. And this is where an organization like OW2 fits and where some of the service I wanted to introduce to you fits. We think that we can contribute to you um, um, uh, developing a, a, a foothold uh, on, on the market and together with, um, uh, well, well, 
all this and the and the investment by even by the European Commission, we constitute the uh, European open source ecosystem. So what I, I would like to uh, I would like to sell you now is the idea to that you need to develop your code, but you need to test the user acceptance of this code, and testing the user acceptance or aligning the code or what you do with the, the users is uh, is called beta testing. So you have the alpha testing, which is for the internal team, but at some point you need to go out there and put your code, your application in a, what is usually called a minimum variable product, MVP. You put that together and you let it use uh, by people you don't know. So it's a risk, but it's a risk that brings a lot of benefits and many, a lot of uh, uh, lessons. So this, the benefits are, first of all, that all the participants in the development are aligned. You have like a central point of reference with a central point of feedback. Um, that generates quality as well, because you need to, um, uh, uh, you need to package it. You need to uh, add to this, to this code what are called earlier on the product attributes, at least the minimum model of those. Um, it helps uh, uh, position your, your product more in the market and identify uh, how users will use your product. It's very often we have uh, feedback that we did not expect and people say, oh yes, this is particularly relevant. This software, this solution is particularly relevant in that kind of circumstances. So you can identify use cases and that will, helps you, that will help you position the, the, position the product. Uh, or, the, or the code of the project. So what is ReachOut? ReachOut is a platform uh, that you can check out at uh, reachout-project.eu. Um, it provides you all the building blocks and the resources to help you develop a um, beta testing campaign. So we call that the beta testing campaign because it's time bound. Um, you will have the, the um, a form, you will be uh, helped to develop your own campaign page, uh, showcasing your, your, your campaign, something you can link to, you can tweet towards it, you can attract beta testers there. Uh, then on the other side, you have the monitoring dashboard with 24 uh, checkpoints uh, that will help you know uh, how you're doing. And it's a checklist of things you have to do and, and you can rate the completion of that. So with this, you can also use that to communicate inside the team or to communicate with your uh, funding, uh, funding partners. Overall, a campaign is a three to five month uh, uh, cycle uh, where you have, uh, you have to work, look at the strategy of your campaign, uh, see, uh, develop some technical tasks, so package the software the way I've, uh, I've mentioned. There is a, uh, some point you will need to communicate, but we provide you the templates for the, the contact mails, uh, press releases, uh, everything you need. So we, have, we already have the templates you can use so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you will have to engage with, um, with beta testers. And at the end, you will have to uh, collect feedback and analyze that. And to do that, we provide, we also provide the questionnaires. We, we provide you a questionnaire templates. So you, you, we, we, take, we take you by the, by the hand and make sure from uh, beginning to completion of your beta testing campaign. So next, first thing you have to do now is, uh, in fact, log on to uh, reach out. Um, once you register, uh, you get to the website, you register, we, uh, we, we, co we contact you, we arrange a uh, demonstration, we analyze what uh, you need to do, and we make sure, and that's how, what um, Andrea introduced us, that's why Andrea introduced us as a uh, marketing support or helping open source projects, is that we do that for pro open source projects because we want this open source project to be aligned with the market expectations. We don't want this open source project to just go and disappear because they've missed the market. So that's, that's one of the resources that we are putting together to, um, and it's financed by the European Commission. So it's totally free. So you just have to go there and we, with us, you will develop something that is more and more aligned with the market. So in summary, 
uh, we say that open source has won, but not all projects are equal. You better make some effort to align with the market expectations. And the mainstream user makes a business decision. So you need to uh, not only have your legal side uh, in order, but you need to have your marketing side in order as well. So develop a beta testing campaign with reach out. And if you want to know more about it, there is a demonstration next week at this uh, webinar that we organized jointly with the Eclipse Foundation, uh, just to show that uh, in open source software, well, so we open and we cooperate. And uh, this, you have the, the link there, so you will have the slides or you can check it out on the OW2 website, which is, uh, uh, 3w2.org and on the homepage you will have the link to register to this webinar. So that's what I had to share with you today and thank you very much. I'm ready to take any questions. Um, maybe I could go on with my very short presentation that I really have five slides and then we can do a q and If this is okay for everybody. Sure. All right. I stop sharing. Yes. I hear no comments around. So I take that. As in yes. Yeah. All right. Mm, let me see. If and now I can. Hold on, I need to see how I can duplicate. Yep. No, I have two screens and I have to, I have to share one. So I, I can't really put it in, uh, in play mode. So you have to bear with me this time. All right, let me see. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Can you read? Yes, we see. Okay, cool. I literally have five slides. Well, if you count also the, the first one, then we, it's six. And it's not the 1st of June, but it's the 9th of December, 2020. Good. Okay. So uh, I, will, I will just share some very common knowledge about open source software. And basically the first question, well, the, the main question you have to ask you is where is the value? And uh, the three best answers I could find, and of course they're probably not the only ones. So anybody that has something to add, I uh, will be happy to have this in, in the conversation, are the three following main models, meaning the freemium, the data-driven and the support-driven. Where in the freemium, you have the core of the app, well, of the software, well, let's call the app. The app is fine. The core of the app is free and open source. The premium features are closed sourced and paying. I hope this is uh, this is clear for everybody. So you still you still see my screen, are you? Yes. Uh, the second uh, model that we can look at is data driven which is where the software itself is not very important, but the data collected by the, the web application or the chain, the data and the management of the data is where the value is. The third is support driven, meaning that the software and or service is free to use, but uh, they, the software developer slash uh, publisher uh, generates a revenue stream by selling maintenance contracts. And I'm gonna give you a couple of, of examples of all the cases. So freemium, this is probably the most common. The basic features are the easiest to discover and work for basic use. 
as usage increases, need for premium features kick in. We'll, we'll talk more about this in a second. Let me give you a couple of examples. So one uh, very noticeable case is Docker. Um, I actually, I double checked right before uh, doing the presentation. Uh, I am not 100% sure that, uh, what, I, what, that uh, what I'm writing is correct. It has been correct a while ago, probably still is. Uh, that with Docker, uh, some of uh, the binaries are uh, free to use, some of the source code is open, and some, some other is not. Meaning that uh, when you install Docker using a, uh, on Linux, using your package manager, what you install there is the basic version, which is uh, free and it's open source. But on top of that, you can buy a license that allows you to unlock other features for which you need to install more software. And this is what generates a revenue stream. Another case is Rocket Chat. Rocket Chat, I'm happy to talk about them because is a member of the OW2 uh, Foundation. Well, OW2 Working Group. It's people, it's very nice people that we met uh, this year at uh, FOSTEM in Brussels. Uh, together with, uh, with Cedric just before uh, COVID-19 kicked in. Uh, Rocket Chat is uh, basically a competitor of um, Slack and of Mattermost. Uh, their business model is that they have uh, a free and open source version that everybody can install. Then they have two more versions that have more features. But most important, the main, uh, the main differentiator I could find was the amount of notifications that are involved, that are included, at least, uh, at least for the first uh, tier of paying license that you have. So basically, when you're really not using the app that much, you can use it for, you can use it for free. But if, you, but if it becomes a part of your daily routine, that mm, you probably will need to pay something. Uh, the third is MySQL. MySQL is a very early unicorn because it was, I think it's uh, the development started maybe some 20 years ago, at some point in the, in the 2000 or maybe even before, I'm not sure. Um, it uh, became very, very quickly one of the most widely used databases in the world at the moment where the majority of the customers were using, it for, the majority of the users were using it for free, so they were not customers. They had and still have free, free and open source features and uh, uh, enterprise uh, paying features that uh, they make money on. And uh, MySQL, I believe, was developed first in Finland and it was uh, bought by Sun Microsystem which eventually was bought by Oracle. When Oracle bought it, so Oracle being the largest database software developer in the world, when Oracle bought it, uh, they saw it as competition and they, the community didn't like the fact, so they forked it. And what was MySQL now became MariaDB, I believe. But My, MySQL exists uh, still, and it's still somehow supported and developed. The second, model is what I call data-driven, meaning that the software is mostly free to use, but the data contained in the, in the software makes it valuable. It works very well with building software as a service out of an open source, and the goal is an exit or just selling data. I'm going to give you two examples that uh, will make it very, very clear. Uh, for you what, uh, what this scenario could be. First is Bitcoin and Ethereum, where the software is licensed under Apache 2 and uh, it is, it is community-driven, meaning that you can, uh, you can download the, the code, you can do some modifications, you can do a pull request, and it could be that the developers accept it and then your code becomes part of the next uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum client. So probably no one is ever gonna charge you to use a Bitcoin or Ethereum, but the value is in the chain. In Bitcoin is the fact that it became a de facto currency. In Ethereum is the fact that you can offer running smart contracts as a service. 
So people make money uh, out of allowing other people to use the infrastructure, as well as uh, developing software and services that runs on infrastructure. Then we have NPM and uh, GitHub. So those two are a case of uh, partial open source because for NPM, I believe that the client is free and the server is not. Uh, and GitHub is uh, notably based on the software Git. To those of you who don't know the history of Git, I recommend to check the Wikipedia page. It's very interesting because Git was uh, developed by Linus Torvalds. So the guy that wrote Linux in the very beginning. And Linus Torvalds wrote the first version of Git in four days. And it became the absolute standard in the industry for version control. So GitHub is a shell or a, a piece of software that wraps uh, the software that Linux Torvald, Torvald uh, uh, wrote in 2000. I think it was 2000 and eight or something. It, NPM and GitHub together make up uh, the largest software repos in the world. And Microsoft had, uh, according to me, the very clever idea of buying both of them respectively, res respectively for $4 billion and seven point something billion dollars. Uh, when Microsoft bought GitHub, I think it was a couple of years ago, maybe three, uh, GitHub was already profitable, uh, even though um, the profit was little, and Microsoft was one of its largest customers. While with NPM, uh, even though they have uh, paying uh, services, uh, my, my, my guess is that uh, they don't make uh, any revenue. And Microsoft just bought it because of the gigantic uh, software repo. Because uh, if you work with JavaScript now, whatever you're looking for, you're looking at an NPM. So this is the, the data-driven model. And the third one is support-driven, which is the old, uh, it's probably the first business model that uh, came together with uh, open source software. Meaning that the software is mostly free to use and revenue stream comes from support and training. So one example for all, Red Hat, Red Hat and, and Ubuntu. They sell support to customers and certification to partners. Um, not sure how many of you know, but Red Hat was bought by IBM, I believe last year for an amount of money that I found to be astronomical, but the reality makes a lot of sense. It was sold, I think for $34 billion to IBM. And um, the, re the reason behind this purchase for this amount of money is apparently not the licensing, uh, sorry, not the, the service uh, licensing and the support uh, and training that Red Hat was selling to customers and partners, but the fact that Red Hat had a cloud and uh, IBM needed cloud in order to compete with uh, AWS and with uh, Microsoft. That made the price levitate. So this is the oldest uh, business model as far as I know. The other uh, came later along with the internet. And uh, it's very important to know that uh, this list may be very incomplete. And most important, uh, you can very well mix components of the, the, the three models into uh, the product and service that you want to work on. So you could have, uh, you could be have, you, you could have a freemium setup where uh, some of the product and service is free, some is uh, paid, and then you also sell support. And um, and certifications, if you grow to the level where you can afford that. Okay, that was my presentation. I hope it was quick enough for everybody. I see that there are some questions in the chat. Okay, someone had to leave. Right, so no questions were relevant. Good. Is there, now it's time for Q&A. We've been here for an hour. We can spend, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes if anybody has questions. Else uh, we can just call it a day. Uh, hello, uh, 
Andrea, this is Roberto from Orbium. Um, yes. I have a question uh, for the speakers and, and for you. And it's a practical question about our, our reality as a startup and maybe other teams in the Ledger program uh, might be uh, also thinking the same thing, which is going very practical. Uh, what are the main strategies for startups like us that where we don't have much resources, we don't have much data, we don't have much community, we're just starting. Yeah. And we fear the fact that if we open source the, our solution, uh, it might get copied out. Um, so what are the strategies for, for, our, for our size? Uh, maybe I can try and answer you first. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, my, my feeling, I've, I've been working with software development since the 90s. So the, the, first, the first job I had was in 99, but uh, I have been involved with that for at least a couple of years before that. My feeling is that uh, the fact that your software is closed source today, it doesn't really make that much of a difference unless uh, Microsoft or, uh, or Amazon are interested. Why is that? because most pieces of software today are uh, simply uh, too complex and too much work for anybody else to dig into it. So if your software is open source, in order for anybody to use it, the person will need to go through the code, install it, well, install it locally, do a test deployment, figure out how it works. And after that, after doing some reverse engineering of your code, they would have to realize what is the thinking behind that. So why you develop that feature? Who will need that feature? Why is this flow working in that sense? And that's stuff that they cannot find in the software. They can only find if they do the market research that you're supposed to be doing. So uh, generally speaking, if you look at, um, uh, at popular writers that wrote books and blogs about the startups, the message they constantly send is, dear startup, no one cares about your brilliant idea because uh, having a brilliant idea is 1% of the work. Developing something that works around is maybe 10%. Then 9% comes after. 90% is getting people to know your product, to use your product, and uh, yeah, to, to perceive the value of your product and to generate a re revenue stream from you. And this, this meeting is not about this. This meeting is about software licensing. So this is very, very, very basic. Uh, this meeting is about uh, or giving you some starting point uh, in knowledge that would allow you to do some proper thinking regarding the question of should you, should you license your software as Apache 2 or as FRO GPL3? That's what we're talking about today. Later on, we can also work uh, with uh, marketing of uh, open source uh, software and services. But my, my strategy for now is try and figure out, well, my, my recommendation for strategy is try to figure out which model you, you think your software or service uh, fits better on try and figure out uh, who your users can be, what they can use for free, what you can charge for. And then based on that, you can formulate a marketing strategy. I don't know if anybody else wants to add something, maybe Cedric. Uh, Ahmed had a uh, comment about, uh, about this. I don't know if... Uh... Yeah. Yes. Who is Cedric? Or is it, is it Catherine? That is yeah, I, can, I, can, I can add something to that. Sure. Um, if you are a strong innovator and you think that you can conquer the market and build a very uh, strong position on this market, then you have no incentive to go open source unless you want to be a, a good ethical entrepreneur and share your wealth with the rest of the market. So there is no incentive if you really are a leader and a strong innovator. Now, the thing is, this situation doesn't happen very often. And uh, the sheer size of a startup of small size 
is a real handicap already and that does not build that doesn't help build trust with uh, customers um, especially if uh, if the funding is not really there so to go um, proprietary you need to have a, a strong innovation strong team and a very strong financial backup now since most companies don't have that the only uh, or the best way is really to go open source. Why? Because open source lowers the barriers to access to your product. With open source and, for instance, with the beta testing that I mentioned earlier on, you can have your products in many, many different hands. Uh, you can uh, get the feedback. You can learn. And you can really uh, build some experience and build your own advantage on the market. And that kind of experience, uh, you can start owning some customers. And that gives you a lead on the market that is very difficult to imitate. This, uh, the, uh, to be ahead of the learning curve is more difficult to, uh, it's more difficult to catch up to, with someone who's ahead of the learning curve than with someone who has more money. So what open source is about is about credibility, branding, numbers and learning and building experience on the market. So today, uh, because mo most software now are being built on uh, existing components, uh, it, you just look at a, a piece of software, what it does, and you can probably replicate it. So if you do your software in a proprietary way, chances are that uh, six months later, three to six months later, an open source um, arrival will be available out there on the market. So you better uh, try to do to go open source yourself by hoping to attract the contributors that instead of uh, instead of um, uh, 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 competing with you will contribute to your own project. It's I know it's not uh, it's counterintuitive. But uh, that's the way it goes today in the in a in a market in open source uh, in a software market, where uh, most of the applications today are built in by reusing existing components. Thank you, Cedric. Very well, well, very well told. Okay. But uh, this makes me think that we will have to set up a webinar as well with uh, where, where, the, where the focus will be marketing of open source uh, projects and that we can do with our partners uh, from, from Blue Morpho as well. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Teresa. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a, a question in relation to uh, what Marco and Cedric was explaining and you, uh, Andrea, explained later on in terms of the, if we chose to have a freemium type of business model, would that mean that the uh, free um, uh, open source license that we used will apply to the part of the software that it's free? And then those components that are the premium features are outside that, that license or covered by a different license? Um, uh, Teresa, I know a little bit the service you're working on. And since I know the service, I, I may not have understood your question correctly, but I sense that you're confusing uh, licensing with uh, the features you offer in a service? Uh, I just, maybe, maybe that's the case. It, it was my understanding from the, from what Marco was explaining um, about how the open source license work on what we publish open source. I, I will give you an example. Uh, you can, most of today, today's uh, hosting services, they run 100% on open source software, free and open source software, because they use Linux. Then they use uh, control panels that could be web mean and virtual mean. But then, then they write a little bit of glue code that allows them to do, uh, to do billing. But many of them run 100% on open source code. Nonetheless, they charge you for a service. 
Okay. So what you're paying is not the licensing of the code. You're paying for the service that they offer you by uh, allowing you to use their software infrastructure and hardware infrastructure. So don't, don't confuse the licensing of the software with charging a license fee for use for the usage of services. Okay. Okay, thank you. So in other words, you can have a software that is 100% open source and you can charge people to use it in a SaaS setup, software as a service setup. And sometimes you can have a an SSAS that uh, doesn't mandate you to uh, to distribute software according to a free software license. So there are different. My my general suggestion is to uh, get a general understanding on how the uh, free licenses work and on how. Uh, the possibilities of uh, free software licenses apply to your case because it's a very concrete issue. You have to understand how you can, what's the better free software license for your project. And this is a very concrete issue. It depends on details. Okay, thanks. Okay, anybody else? I have a question. Um, this is Antonio. Um, and this one is a bit, um, so if we take an example no, that uh, we are using, we are using MongoDB. Um, um, yeah, so they created this uh, special license now to prevent uh, the software as a service um, and so on. But yeah. my question is that is they, they also provide commercial licenses over the, the the same open source project, um, I'm not sure how does it work because uh, is it like if you are the owner of the open source lic uh, pro licensed project, does it mean that you are also you can also sell commercial licenses in a different way or how how does it? I'm completely lost on that area. Oh, this is a very central question, and thank you for asking because uh, I think it's the it's the core of the open source freemium model is that. Um, no. If you want, I say something. I, I, lied. I lied. I I, I can't say something. I can say something about it, Mark, and then you're very welcome to, to, to okay. add. Uh, so uh, the license is a contract between the developer and the user. The contract allows you to use the software under certain condi condition. Uh, you can, for example, uh, compare the contract that a movie theater have to sign when they receive a film from a film company. So if you want to project the latest Spider-Man movie, you get this, uh, this film and you're allowed to show it in a certain, for a certain amount of days in a certain theater. If you show it in a different theater, then you're, up, you're outside the license. If you make a copy of that film, you're outside the license. Uh, what happens is that when you decide, when you, when you buy the rights to show that film for 30 days and you want to extend it for 30 more days, then you do a new contract. So the way these licenses work, uh, let's take, for example, HGPL3. HGPL3 says that uh, anything using the software license as HGPL3 whether calling it uh, as, as in the same way you call a library or calling it via APIs. So all the software using the software covered by HGPL3 has to be of licensed with a license that is compatible with the, with the GNU uh, license, list of licenses. This means that uh, let's take uh, let's take let's talk about uh, for example our crypto tool Zenroom. Zenroom is licensed under HGPL3. If you want to use Zenroom within your solution, as long as all the software that speaks with Zenroom within your solution is free and open source, then you are within the HGPL license. 
the moment you have a closed source component that speaks to Zenroom, you're outside the license. So what, what do we have to do? We do a relicensing with a different proprietary license that you can call the sales exception. So we say um, Antonio is allowed to use Zenroom uh, every Monday from 10 to 11 using this software and he has to pay me a banana and an apple per week. That's it. Okay. Okay. So you can relicense your own software as much as you want under as many licenses as you want to wherever you want. And you can literally license your software for use only in the morning of certain days of the week or only certain people are allowed to use the software. This is extremely common in the software industry. I've seen it very many times happen. Andrea, if I, if I may add something here, uh, it's a concept that is uh, difficult to grasp is that it's the privilege of the vendor to decide on pricing and licenses. Now you probably all are uh, subscribed to a, uh, a smartphone or a mobile phone um, operator. And uh, you've seen these ads uh, from uh, competing operators trying to lure you from and entice you to change from one operator to the next operator at a very competitive price. So if you change, from one operator to another operator, you get 20% or 50% uh, rebate on the first year. But if you're already a customer of the same operator and you keep the, the operator, I mean, for the existing customers, they will be paying 50% 50, 50 more. And they could say this is unfair, but that's because it's the privilege of the operator to say for new customers, the price will be that. And for the existing consumers, the price will be unchanged. Same thing for the license. You can have one piece of software and that piece of software can be sold uh, or can be licensed to a category of users under an open source license and can be licensed to another category of users with a commercial license with different rights, different privileges, different obligations. That's uh, price or uh, legal discrimination, and that can be the initiative of the vendor. So that can happen also from your, with your own product. If you have a product, a, a platform that is open source, it can be accessible, downloadable for free, but you can also build additional product that will be the, uh, this additional product made available to the market under commercial license. That's the essence of the freemium uh, um, model. At OW2, we're not very, not that keen on the freemium model because sometimes it can, it depends um, what's the, the usage and the functionality that are embedded in the open source uh, platform. So if the open source part is, can still be used and provide a full um, range of functionality, it's okay. And you can have additional product as long as these additional product, commercial product or proprietary soft product are developed specifically for one category of users, narrow category of users, and do not create um, uh, undue dependencies. Because otherwise we call that creeperware. We don't want a, um, or open core. We don't want the open source uh, uh, product to be a pretext to claim that you're open source. And in fact, uh, bait the uh, uh, users and then switch them. We call the, the model bait and switch and switch them to a commercial because they cannot use your, your, uh, your initial product uh, uh, the, in, with a free license. And with what MongoDB has done, it's uh, still very much debated uh, uh, whether they had the right to do that. And um, uh, I would personally, I would stay away from that. Marco, you seem that you want to add something. Yeah, very easy concept. Um, if you are the owner of a, of a software in the sense that you made it, you have the right to license it or give it to third parties as you want. So if you have full copyright 
on a piece of software and you distribute it according to uh, a free software license, you are still able to relicense the same piece of software according to different uh, licenses. So uh, this is true, but uh, I mean, uh, it's true that it's possible to distribute uh, software according to a free software license and then license according to other uh, licenses, proprietary or not, but not always. So you have to be the owner of what you want to relicense. So you have to look, uh, for example, you with uh, Zen, Zen code, the Zen room, it's all software made by, uh, by Dina, then you can do what you want. But if you uh, reused software, you have to uh, check if you can do this. So that's what I wanted to highlight. You have to have full rights to relicense according to a different license. Uh, okay. uh, to add something very, very quickly, you, you need to understand uh, if it's in your interest that as many people as possible uh, use use and, uh, and replicate and add uh, something to your software or, uh, or or the other way around uh, you want to make money out of limiting who can use that because for example with Bitcoin in, uh, the money is in the data with Bitcoin or GitHub or even Facebook the money is in the data so you may it's in your interest that the software grows so you may want to relicense uh, with a very, very um, uh, permissive license like Apache 2 or BSD. Uh, if uh, you want to sell features to users, so the value is in using the software, not in the data, then you want to use a more restrictive license. And maybe next to, a, to something else that is a uh, closed source. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a central point, guys, and I guess that after this question, those of you who have been uh, hearing after conversation got lost at some point, I think that after this question it makes sense that as soon as we publish the webinar on our YouTube channel, you go back and you watch the beginning when Mark is explaining what each license can do or cannot do, because that is the part that helps you. And we, we should actually have had this conversation in the beginning, then explaining what each license allows you and prevents other people to do and then it would have made more sense but now you can uh, you have all the pieces we're gonna uh, publish it on our youtube channel and then you can have a look at it again okay uh we have uh, five more minutes if there are more questions that's uh, a quick question maybe it's not quick but, sure um sorry i missed the beginning uh, but I assume by looking at the agenda that you have not covered anything about the hardware licenses, right? I'm not sure. This, this we need to ask Marco. Uh, you, you're muted, Marco. Uh, we didn't speak about uh, specific hardware licenses. There are a few. Uh, so my, yes. Yeah, my question is the following. If if there is an obvious, let's say, um, approach to to the hardware uh, issue let's, of licensing in, in your point of view, because there are a few hardware licenses, uh, as you probably know. And, um, and to make the question more specific, what we are doing is we have, we have developed we have uh, we have developed some hardware. It's a weather station, uh, some other sensors, uh, some other. Let's to keep the discussion simple. Let's say we have a weather station. This weather station is uh, it's open source. Well, we are we wish to release it as open source. We haven't tied up. We haven't documented our work yet. So it's uh, and so for the time being, is is not published. Um, and um, and we have a service that this hardware connects to. This service is built on open source uh, software with Apache license, and we have added a lot of features to this software. 
and um, we will release this as open source as well. Um, and our revenue model is is a combination of what Andrea said. So we are uh, there is value in the data that it is produced. Uh, so so that's you know after you you buy this whole solution, value is generated from the data that you produce. But this value remains to the customer. Um, we will sell a service uh, because we are hosting all. Uh, we are hosting the software, and we are storing the data, and we're giving the dashboards and everything to our customers. So we are selling this service, and uh, we are also we also make profit from the hardware itself, even though it's open source. Nobody is going to bother to reproduce this hardware and, and compete with us. So it makes sense. We can sell it more expensive than the bill of materials, obviously, and, and make some profit out of that. So in, in this scenario, I, I wanted to ask, uh, is there an obvious license specifically for the hardware that you would recommend? Well, a, a strong copyleft license that allows the users to have access to the, am I, yes, uh, to have access uh, uh, to the design of the hardware uh, should, should work. One of the specific open hardware licenses that, uh, um, that provide uh, uh, better for the right for the user to have access to the design. GPL is okay, but I think some open hardware license also uh, can work. So the certain open hardware license is some version because there are different, uh, uh, I would suggest to be as, uh, uh, as open as possible. Uh, copyleft uh, open hardware license is okay because in hardware, as you said, the value is in the trademark mostly, like Arduino uh, built its, uh, its business in, in the trademark more than in the design of the, of the objects. So, some licenses though, they introduce, I mean, I, I wanna rephrase a question um, that was said earlier. Uh, so, so, you know, in, there is this concern that if we release something with uh, with an open source license, somebody will copy it. I, I, I'm not afraid of this. Uh, I don't think anybody will copy it because like Andrea said, there is, and, and like uh, Thomas also said, there is so much other aspects uh, related to that nobody cares about your software in, uh, in the first place. However, if you release something as open source license with an open source license, there is an overhead. You have to document it properly you have to, uh, you know, find out the, the 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 basics of licensing and and make sure that you're doing it properly. And specifically about hardware, what I found out that is that there is a lot of overhead involved because it's not just the source that you have to give. You also have to to give a number of different, let's say, design elements in order to help somebody reproduce the hardware. So, so there's a lot of overhead, overhead to maintain this. And the question in my mind is, what is the benefit for me as a, as a vendor, as a developer, uh, since what I'm releasing is so complex that nobody is going to collaborate with me? I think I'm afraid that nobody will collaborate with me. So why am I doing it? Well, Cedric explained very, very well because uh, people feel have more trust in people that release the design. Uh, Arduino uh, built its reputation around this, I, I would say. So, in releasing design of the hardware, even if very few people copied the design of, uh, of, uh, of Arduino to make uh, other products. Somebody did it, but you know, if when it's Arduino, it's Arduino. You have a trademark. You have you, you tend to prefer an Arduino with Arduino trademark uh, object. So, but Cedric, maybe can tell you more about this aspect. Yeah, I understand the the side advantages. Yes, but mm -hmm. yeah, okay. 
but yeah, sorry. Um, you ask me for uh, advantage. Okay. <coughs> in the soft in the software business, uh, in the nineties, when all the um, software vendors were created using open source licenses, they could do this because instead of inventing a new product category like business intelligence, uh, customer relationship management, uh, database, etc., they were in fact because this product categories have been invented by proprietary vendors. These proprietary vendors have invested a lot of money in research and development and in creating the market. Now, most of the, the, the second wave of uh, open source vendors did not invent anything. They uh, came into a market that had already been prepared by the proprietary vendors and they could develop their offerings by um, uh, reusing, by first of all, uh, when I say it was prepared, the standards uh, de facto de jure had already been established. So they only had to uh, go and imitate uh, uh, the behavior of some existing software by um, combining components because they were, uh, they did not have to uh, create every pieces of software like the Oracle in the beginning at the turn of the nineties, Oracle and Microsoft, they had to invent or Adobe that invented everything. Now today you can do the same thing by reusing uh, just a, uh, doing your own bit of material, but in, so in software terms and that exists. That's what, that's what we do. Now, in your case, um, maybe you don't have any incentive, proper in objective incentive to go open source. Maybe not. The, you have to look at why you would do that. You would do that because you want to be imitated. You want other people to replicate what you've done, or you want other people to access to uh, your, those all the specifications and understand them so that they can build on top of that, or so that they can in, in, uh, build the, te the technology ecosystem that will provide uh, uh, you value and would make you the, the keystone player in this ecosystem. Th that would be one of the reasons for opening up and attracting people. And if you open up fast enough, uh, somebody else who tried to imitate your strategy would come too late because people would have already uh, invested their time, energy, and competence in developing their own software or uh, hooking up with your own product. So that would be one incentive for you to have blueprints and specifications and bills of materials that are uh, uh, easily accessible, uh, understandable, well-documented, and well-licensed. And for, for these, uh, essentially, I mean, uh, actually we're not talking about the OSI licensing here because OSI licenses are more for software. Uh, we probably are talking about uh, of uh, uh, creative common licenses, which are more for all sorts of content. I, I don't know, I'm not so specialist in that, but you may be, you may want to look at these licenses. Yeah. Oh. Because it's, it's hardware. So the hardware itself is uh, difficult to replicate. Of course, it has a cost uh, and Everything that is immaterial, uh, which is uh, the the processes, the uh, uh, the blueprints, uh, the this the things that can enable somebody to replicate what you what you've done, um, that has to be. If you want to do it, do it properly. Just one uh, one one point. I I don't suggest to use Creative Commons licenses for hardware because Creative Commons licenses do not manage mask rights, rights on semiconductors, mask rights. Uh, while uh, uh, hardware design uh, is protected by mainly mask rights, uh, rights on semiconductor, uh, semiconductor uh, design. Yeah, but we're not making our own semiconductors. I mean, eh? we're, we're not we're not printing our own chips. We're not making our own semiconductors. We are just making our own boards, a PCB. Ah, okay. So we just select components and we put on a PCB. And I think most of the innovative work uh, that we do is in the firmware of the device. So it it's software, software. but it's software that lives inside a specific hardware. And then you have a specific box, let's say. So there is some design aspects into the box. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get me wrong, I, I, ethically speaking and emotionally speaking, I absolutely 
want our product to be open source and I would love to to have a product that has created some community around it. Uh, but is my question is like oh, it's, it's, oh, sorry, we, we yeah. need to cut this. Yeah, yeah, I'm expanding. I'm just saying that yeah, yeah, that is there a is there a license that will help towards this direction more than a different li license? That was my my let's say initial question. Uh, can we take it offline and uh, we work? We, we we do a channel on Mattermost, and we will discuss further. I, I would like uh, I would like uh, the people from um, Ginkop to tell to to, to tell. Can we questions. can we contact Thomas and Marco in the future? Uh, I mean, when we are ready for this discussion, because yes, I, I sure. wasn't ready for this discussion. Sure, if you send me the questions per email, I will forward it to them. Yeah, in absolutely. the future. In the future. Yep. There is a, there are, there are people that are so there are some of the founders of Ginkop. Ginkop is a startup that works with DNA data, so it's a very 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 hot topic. That have questions about privacy. Is it about patents? No oh, patents. Yeah. Patent. Yes, about the patents. So I, I looked uh, I don't know a few years ago also in Open Invention Network. And was yeah, actually quite interested in it because I thought that this is a good way to, to protect yourself with your open source software. But I'm curious what your opinion about this is because it's a huge network. And I don't know if it, if it indeed adds value and, and protects uh, the open source community. It's to me the question. I don't know this this project, so I can't. It it, it is basically a, a very big network. I think uh, supported also by the, the big companies for open source, and uh, I think you can easily uh, become a member if you have uh, have an open source product uh, and, and and tell them uh, that it is there and 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 just list it, and then you're part of a very big community that uh, fights against patent trolls. Yeah. Ah, patent innovation. Yes. Ah, yes. okay. Yes, uh, it's uh, very useful for the free software environment. Okay, because I, I couldn't find it, and I was uh, looking into if if Dine and others are also using it, and I couldn't find their names on it. So I was a bit surprised because uh, I thought that that uh, yeah, most of the companies or most of the software development should uh, should take advantage of it. Okay. Well, we've, we have mixed feelings with regard to Open Innovation Network at W2. We've had this discussion several times there. Uh, first of all, if you join Open Innovation Network, it means that de facto you recognize that uh, software can be patented. Yeah. Which is something that we do not. Yeah, I agree. Meaning, meaning Open Innovation Network is not within our remit. It's outside of our scope. Uh, having said that, I'm aware that many, many companies are, are there. They, they are very aggressive at recruiting uh, uh, companies. Uh, I mean, the, the price is marginal. I don't think, I think it's even free. Yeah. Um, but uh, I discuss with members. I mean, you should discuss with, with members. We don't really see the, uh, the use for that. The, the use for Open Innovation Network probably lies in its history. In the history that goes way back at a time where um, big software vendors used or wanted to patent their, their software and, um, and hence got, uh, um, got fighting with uh, those uh, patent trolls. So that's, uh, that's something that is probably much more American than, uh, than European. And uh, well, I'll stop here because I don't, uh, first of all, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, a huge disclaimer here. And uh, you need to really consult with uh, an actual lawyer. But the thing is, our perspective is that patents is not a European uh, problem, even if it's something that comes back regularly. Uh, it also comes back along with standards. I mean, patents and standards are uh, issues that are very confusing for open source software. They, uh, people don't understand open source software, often uh, are mentioned or they throw in patents and they throw in the standard and they talk about open standards and these, these are different rational, in, in fact, something quite different. Um, so the, the patent, you think, has its roots 
in the uh, North American industry that allowed uh, uh, software patenting. That is not the case in Europe, even if uh, there is still some danger that it may come, come back or, or be uh, uh, recognized uh, again. So today, I would say it's not an issue, at least from the OW2 standpoint. Uh, we are not looking at uh, software patents and we are not looking at open innovation network either. Okay, thank you. That's, that's yes. clear. <laughs> if, if I can add, uh, uh, of course, uh, patent, it's, a, it's, a, it's an American issue. It's a US issue because they have software patents and some other European countries unfortunately recognize the software patents in, in judges of some European countries, uh, but not in, not in Italy, not in France, uh, so we are lucky. Uh, what I suggest, I mean, there are uh, domains where patents uh, count, like, for example, in uh, audio, video, coding and decoding. There, there, is, there are patent pools and uh, hardware, hardware uh, vendors need to deal with those patent pools when they want to, uh, to use software that uh, interfere with those patents. But usually, as Cedric said, in many uh, free software open source areas, patent don't, don't matter. So, and you know it because if you are in the in a certain technological area, you know if you have to deal with patents, especially if you work uh, uh, in the in research in that area. So, don't look for the problem. I agree with Cedric. Don't look for the problem, but uh, uh, in In certain areas, there is the problem. Unfortunately, when you when you work uh, in a um, uh, global dimension, you have to deal with uh, US and some other countries where the uh, patents are uh, software patents are unfortunately recognized. I'm strongly against software patents. I think it's a, it's a bad thing. But okay. Thank, thank you. <laughs> right. So we get better put our time in something else. That is the message, I think. <laughs> Can I add something about this, Andrea? Sure. Um, I've been working professionally with, with startups now for maybe 20 years. Yeah, and yeah. whenever a, a, a bigger company wants your software, uh, we would tend to go after the software that is actually propri proprietary as long as they don't meet the financials to fight some legal battles. Because if, you, if we would start a legal battle in, uh, for example, uh, the US, uh, Europe, and uh, most of the time in Korea, you would not have the funds to keep up. You would go broke and we would get the software for free and then gain actually the copyright on the software that you developed. And I've seen this happen within the financial sector for like so many, so many times that even at that side, most of the startups are all open source just to protect themselves from these kinds of legal battles because at the end, even your innovation is getting broken uh, because you're, you don't have the rights anymore to the software that you actually developed. So you're saying that you've seen legal battle of startups that were closed source because? No, no, I, I think I can add, that was one of the reasons the Open Invention Network was also, I think, set up because they, that, that happened also to some big companies, I think, especially. And they said uh, the legal fights you get out of this yeah. exactly uh, are so big that we have to protect ourselves as a community against it. That's wow. also, I think, one of the drivers of But then again, the trouble is that you also thereby say we acknowledge software patterns and, and we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, what happened when my, when MySQL was forked into MariaDB. That the community simply didn't want to have to cope with uh, Oracle, so they forked it. Yeah, and if MySQL was uh, for, uh, of a startup that had a closed proprietary license, and Oracle would uh, take them to a legal battle by stating that 
uh, even though they would be completely wrong, as long as you can keep up the court battle long enough and over multiple places, because uh, 10 million for uh, a court battle for Oracle is absolutely nothing. They would gain the full rights to MySQL and then uh, protect yeah. their own patents. So you couldn't couldn't fork it anymore. True. Sorry, sorry, I have a question about this topic. So just to the take out from this is that if you make it open source, then you don't have this uh, potential issue with big companies or, or how does it uh, protect you? Because they can also claim that you have made open source something that they have a patent on or, or doesn't, or it doesn't make any sense. I'm, I'm not sure, you have to understand this, this, uh, this topic that has been discussed now. Well, the, the license is one of the first things that you actually develop. And the moment that you put something on GitHub or make it publicly available in any kind of way, you can prove very easily that the software has been open source all the time and that no one can actually claim uh, ownership of it. It is public property or in the public domain by that uh, point in time. So you cannot help be held accountable as the owner in a legal battle. OK, OK. Okay. Maybe it's more complex than, than this, but uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, we are running out of time. I, I guess I don't know, Andrea, what you see. Yeah, we, we we are twenty minutes uh, of uh, schedule. I don't know. If there, are there more uh, questions of different topics? Because we can uh, I can set up. I mean, I will set up a channel about licensing, licensing legal and licensing. If we don't have it yet on Mattermost, and then we can chat there. I can invite. Actually, we do. We have a channel called Legal GDPR Licensing Privacy, where we have ten members, and I will invite Marco and I will invite Cedric. So if they want to join, uh, they can uh, they can join us there. Okay, with pleasure. Sounds good. <laughs>